racist and sexist trauma that I had to deal with as a child that had no language around it. Um, and I find that theater and performance and writing for me is a really great way to come to that language and to use that language in translation uh, to others to talk about my experience. Um, I've also uh, written an Alice in Wonderland themed anti-capitalist musical, um, mm -hmm. which is a great deal of fun. Organizing events 
sense myself. I know about the logistical nightmare of never having <coughs> lists that make these things possible. And even though I have been reacting to both the content and the framework, not all of it, but some of it, um, I've been really, really grateful for the opportunity for them to be invited into this space. Um, so the lyrics of the song that I just opened with, uh, it's an Armenian song, and uh, it was gifted to me, um, and it calls to me of my great-grandmother, who is one of my ancestors that I think I work most closely with. And the song is really about opening paths. And the, call, the song calls on us to make space, to make way, to literally clear the path. And in the song, it's literally talking about clearing the path to invite the season of spring in. And for me, this is a really guiding metaphor. It's a call to invite rebirth after death. It's about beginnings of new cycles after old cycles. And it's about waking up, really, and coming alive after periods of rest and hibernation. And I feel like the song is a really powerful metaphor for me personally, but I also uh, feel like it's coming again right now because it's a powerful metaphor for us as a community and as communities, plural, and as part of this conversation about queer theater to come, whatever that means. Um, so I believe that what is next calls on us really to look at ourselves and to look around and really see what is and what is not there, to really see who is and who is not here in this space, to see the impact of our choices and to really strive to step into a place of owning the things we are impacted by and the things that we perpetuate. And so invoking the list poem that Evelyn used on her panel, I want to offer a list of reflections that um, came to me over the last few days. And they are sort of disjointed and non-linear, and they are not original. I am bringing into the space other things that folks have said and lifting up things that folks have said. Um, and here they go. So one, as the descendant of genocide survivors, refugees, immigrants, and now settlers in so-called Canada, the contradictions are always, and I challenge myself to learn how to walk with these challenges with deep accountability, to show up daily willing to do the work. Two, the contradictions of being queer and here in this institution, as in, firstly, a puzzlement about institutions, like the institution of art, the institution of queerness, and then the institution of SFU, a university, a classroom, the Gold Corp Center for the Arts, Gold Corp. To quote Karen Ward, a downtown Eastside activist and brilliant artist, the mining school of death. <laughs> Three, this site has been a site of resistance where members of the downtown East Side, where indigenous, racialized, poor, and marginalized folks in this city have fought hard, continue to fight hard for social justice and right for social housing, right for housing. And I'd like to highlight that there is currently a tent city happening at 58 Hastings, just across the street on the other side of Abbott, where folks are currently, right now, demanding affordable, secure, and safe housing for all. Four, reverence for the stories of struggle that have enabled us to be here today to discuss our queerness and theater, and to highlight how our stories are still and always intersecting with ongoing struggle. Five, I want to call into question the box of queer theater to highlight that many of us on this panel, at this conference, and folks who, for a variety of important reasons, cannot, are not able to be here, we find this box limiting. Not only limiting in that I feel myself stretched to its perimeter and crave being outside of it, but also simultaneously in that it is too narrow and I cannot fit into it, and there is no space inside of it for me because where I am sitting, Queer theater cannot ever only be queer theater. It is also and needs to be indigenous theater, black theater, people of color theater, women's theater, femme theater, trans and gender variant theater, deaf theater, sick, crip, and disabled theater, mad and crazy theater, poor theater, theater of the dispossessed, theater of the marginalized, theater of those whose stories are vital, vital, vital to our being here, stories have not stood center stage, or who have rarely even supported center stage, and who remain still unheard. As in, queer theater is not intersectional because it is queer. Queer theater has a responsibility to interrogate itself and the intersections it is linked with beyond the L, G, and B of our acronyms. Six, 
To be intersectional in lens and practice is action and not only words and jargon. And these actions will mean hurt feelings and discomfort. We have to be willing to friend discomfort and to learn to hold ourselves when our feelings are hurt rather than expect others and structures to support us. Seven, how is privilege playing out in this and all queer theater spaces? Just because we are queer does not mean we do not perpetuate the very oppressions that we as queer people work daily to overcome to be here. Eight, I want to honor the importance of making mistakes. Yay, making mistakes! <laughs> Ha, 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 ha. 
this is a key element in my work when it comes to queer or theater and creation. I believe queer theater is existing in a liminal place at the moment. What I mean by liminal is a space of passing through to the next space. This space holds immense potentials as well as dangers. Potential to move to a new phase and dangers to become ambivalent and stagnant. There are many elements that pose these dangers in my opinion on queer theater, such as lack of queer woman voices, queer people of color, queer people with different cultures, immigrants, queer people with disabilities, and so on. <coughs> these elements are significantly important to talk about and to be conscious of when it comes to creating queer theater. Queer theater to come, in my opinion, cannot be possible either or. It must hold and portray something much more inclusive in order to not misplace its momentum. For me, one of the most important aspects of theater, queer theater, through the liminal space is based on two major elements. One, aesthetic and production quality combined with intellectual property. And two, queer stories not as a, na na a notion separated from the norm, but as part of everyday phenomena of social existence. My work falls between literal or metaphorical binaries in undefined or undefinable spaces. The spaces can manifest, reanimate spaces that may be forgotten. Some of these spaces are nostalgic or completely new, and others are radically transformative. So this is the question that I'm constantly left with in my work. And the question is, does existing outside of codes and convention necessarily mean existing outside? And how can, we work, uh, how can a work of art remain active in its intellectual and social elements while holding aesthetic qualities that are perhaps more tra traditionally rooted in its discipline? Thank
that is on the fringe of the fringe that I kind of relate to most often. Um, is Peter here? Here. Ah! Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have this up! Ah! Amazing, okay. So, um, so some of the art that I wanted to talk about today is, uh, is the art that I've witnessed in the past few years of my life that I think of as the queer art to come. And that also is art very, very, um, th that's young art, that's new art, that's art that I think is doing different things in the queer community. Um, and that art is art primarily concerned with sex um, and isn't always clean um, about how it does that. I'm gonna offer some trigger warnings. Um, I'm gonna offer a trigger warning for BDSM. I'm gonna offer a trigger warning for sexual violence, which I think is, is very separate from BDSM. And I'm gonna offer uh, a trigger warning for racial violence. This image is uh, the, one of the opening shots from a short film that I saw at Mix NYC this year, uh, which if you don't know, is a New York-based queer experimental film festival. And this uh, is from a short film called Lucid Noon Sunset Blush. It is about a um, queer church family that lives in Texas that is um, mostly, uh, although not exclusively, it's a family that's mostly people of color. Um, all either like people who identify as um, femmes, be that cis or trans, and non-binary folk. And they live together uh, in a couple of houses, maybe renting, but maybe squatting. The movie isn't too clear about that. Um, and they support themselves primarily through a bicycle stealing ring uh, <laughs> and sex work. And that's another thing that I've been feeling like the whole week is that uh, that I haven't heard people talk about sex work very often, which I think is probably one of the most traditional forms of queer labor. Um, so I, uh, I sort of really, really appreciated this piece for, uh, for addressing, uh, creating a life with it in that way. Uh, this movie is so fucking fantastic, and you can watch it online. Please go look it up after this. Uh, it has one of the best sex scenes I've ever seen in it in my life, where, uh, where these two beautiful uh, black people who are not thin, are fucking fisting each other and wailing on each other and going to town. And they're not in love and they're part of this queer family. Um, and they're having sex because it feels good and it doesn't need to be about something more than that. And uh, when one lover takes her lover out of, uh, takes her fist out of her other lover's, uh, ah, out of her lover's pussy, uh, they realize that she's lost one of her press on nails in there. <laughs> <laughs> so then she has to go spelunking for the nail. to lose your press on in your own. <laughs> <laughs> so it's this wonderful, it's this wonderful movie that doesn't preach at all. It is like complete alternative slice of life film. Um, and it's, I don't know, maybe a half an hour long. And because it doesn't preach, because it just presents something that is non-heteronormative, non-monogamous, and not legal, the way that these people live is not legal. Um, I, I think it's truly subversive for not saying, uh, this is what I believe, but this is how I exist. And to me, that opens up possibilities to reimagine outside of, outside of certain frameworks. Um, so that's something I think about with the, uh, the, the future of queer art, but... What was the title again, Peggy? Lucid Noon, Sunset Blush. Um, yeah, and it's by uh, Ali Logout. Um, this is a piece that, uh, that, reference, that is a, um, a reinterpretation of a German piece, and it's from 2010. Um, it's a piece of visual art, and often um, my practice, which sometimes involves visual art, but often when I want inspiration, I go to galleries, and I look at sculpture, and that's uh, where my impulse to create comes from. So I tend to look at more visual art often than I do theater. Um, and as much as I think it, the, the future of queer art or queer art to come uh, is a uh, is about looking forward and imagining new possibilities. I think it's also about education. And I think of um, theater works that I enjoy that, um, that include uh, providing a history, since that's not taught to us in schools and institutions. And so I particularly love this piece because um, on the left side of the image of the boy, you see a list of all the things, specifically looking at um, when the AIDS crisis was at its peak. Sorry. When the AIDS crisis was at its peak, the, um, the, the ways in which this boy, being a queer boy, will have to fight. Um, and on the, to the right of him is all the ways in which the queer community will forget him. 
and we'll forget his struggle and we'll forget what he did. Um, so if I'll just read the beginning of it. Uh, One day this kid will die, but before that he will fight. He will fight for men who wear, he will fight men who wear uniforms of priests and rabbis, men who inhabit certain stone buildings, who will call for his death. And then if I skip towards the end, he will lay down his, hmm, sorry, I find this to be so emotional. He will lay, lay down his life for all the boys who, like him, discovered the faith, desire to place their naked body on the naked body of another boy, and they will forget. Um, and so as much as I think we have to always think about new vernaculars and that there is an education, there also, is also a, a really adamant looking back to you. Um, so this is, this is not one piece of art, this is two pieces of art. Uh, on the left is a self-portrait by a few, uh, one of the biggest queer icons I can think of in the art history world, Mark and Robert Maplethorpe. That is a self-portrait that he did in the 80s. And to the right is a uh, reinterpretation of that done by, hands down, one of my favorite artists in the world, Juliana Huxtable, who is a New York-based, who's black, trans, uh, New York-based, poet, performer, DJ, um, model, badass. Um, and so uh, what I like about this piece is that I think that it educates and offers a critique all at once. Um, so Robert Maplethorpe uh, did a lot of photography work surrounding queerness, surrounding male body, surrounding BDSM, but he also, um, in his photographs, fetishized black bodies in a particular way. So they're beautiful photographs, but they're also problematic photographs. Um, and in this, uh, in uh, Juliana's piece, which is called Making Fun of Maple Form, ah, Making Fun of Maple Form, um, I think that she really aptly conveys uh, that history and that we have to be aware of the art that has come before us, but at the same time makes fun of it. So he's holding a machine gun, and she's holding the biggest black dildo I've ever seen in my life. So I really, really love her work, and I think that um, Juliana engages in issues of racism, colonialism, and cultural appropriation in a way that's very intelligent, but that also has a sense of humor, and that is also still grounded in the body and uh, grounded in a very visceral <coughs> way, as opposed to a heady way. Um, we can go to the next thing. So these are, uh, and what I'm going to show you now is mainly what I, what I mentioned the trigger warning for. Um, and this is a piece that Juliana Huxtable did in her A8 magazine, or sorry, in the A8 issue of Richardson magazine this year, um, which engages, uh, which discusses her, her experience as a black trans woman having sex with white people, having sex which includes, includes degradation, having sex which includes racism, um, and getting off on it. And I think that, um, as much as I wish that the things that got me off were, were clean and simple and were things that I could be proud of, someone fingering me and going, I respect you, I respect you, I respect you. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make me count. It doesn't make me count. What does get me off is, is playing with misogyny. Um, my, my childhood involves sex abuse, so it involves playing with, uh, with age play. Um, it involves playing with, with things I'm, I'm not proud of, but having an orgasm makes my day better. It makes me generous. It makes me able to uh, live the next day. Um, so <coughs> my kinship with Juliana's work is I think that she is expressing her own version of, of that sentiment. Um, so if I can uh, highlight some of the things that, uh, that she says in that. Um, I lost my virginity in a pickup truck to avoid a dampening. He was simple, decidedly masculine, infatuated with my person and my body. Something about the particular nexus of my skin, my voice, my hair, my movements made him rise. It's difficult for me to discern between a scar and a fetish. I had desires and I sought them out aggressively on the assumption that they were pure. That sex, unlike the rest of my life, was where I was free, myself, the myself, honest. Uh, the formula seemed relatively simple and straightforward. Forced to internalize the abuse of the Bible Belt town, sex became my freedom. 
um, to people of color or to uh, countries that have colonized in, in this post-colonial time that we're in, what is, what is the moral obligation? And is there, I mean, what, what as, as a power, you have, that imagine money, and I'm asking you, can you just give me some of that? <laughs> <laughs> Queer theater 
weird theater. I mean, like, it's, it's weird. I mean, being here, it's me, like, <sighs> queer theater, this is, this is a, this is, a, this is authentic. This is, this is, yeah. Um, I think that's all I'm going to say right now. Yeah, thank you.
privilege that we do have. Uh, let's acknowledge, you know, the disadvantage that people of color do have. And um, <coughs> once we do acknowledge that, then let's actively, because I don't know why I keep hearing about discussions, but let, let's actively do something about it. You know, take accountability and do something about it. Yeah? Can we agree? Yes. So when I see y'all next time. <laughs>
Yeah, that's it. Great. Can I add that? I don't want to 
to fight. Um, and when things maybe are sounding like we're resisting just for the sake of resisting, um, we're not. Listen, listen closely about what racialized oppression feels like, and it, it means I learned your language and you'll never learn mine. And by learning that, I dug a canyon, a cultural canyon between my mom and my dad. And I, you know, my, I, we don't watch movies together because they don't really understand the English. And if we do, it's like some action movie, so my mom kind of keeps up because she, you know, you can't watch. The other day we watched a Lebanese movie, a Lebanese produced movie, because even Arabic movies, I don't entirely get them. And it was like, best experience of my life. And I was watching this Lebanese movie of taking place in Beirut with my dad and mom. And that's so simple. You, you should watch a movie with your parents. Like, you should have that. I read this book. It was also by a Lebanese author. I read it in English. I bought my mom the book in Arabic, and I said, read it. Um, and so we're getting that experience now. But my whole life, I, uh, oppression against my racialized identity is not this in-your-face thing. It's, it's paper cuts every day, every day, every day, and you learn how to bandage it so that you're, you, you don't feel it anymore. I whiten the shit out of myself, and I don't, I don't mind that. I don't look at whiteness and the West as this enemy and, and terrible power. I think a good idea is a good idea, and a bad idea is a bad idea. So I, I, atheism is a movement that really came out of the Christian white, and I really subscribe to that. So I think a good idea is a good idea. Um, I think we automatically, we, we listen less to good ideas from racialized people mm -hmm. than we do from the West. Um, ah, what, what, I have one point. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> um, no, it's not resistance for the sake of resistance. And I, I, I think about that a lot. I think about that a lot. I think, yeah. Yeah, and it wasn't so much, like, I don't buy into that, but I, I'm also thinking about the question of homonormativity, right? Which is a new thing, right? So queer is in reaction to norms. Is there always going to be a new norm that is going to then further define the horizon of queerness? Right? So it's not about are you know resisting to resist, but rather are, are there going to be always yeah, in, in this kind of <coughs> norm, a new oppressive regime that that we are always going to be struggling with. You know, and then, and then the flip side of that would be, could we then just imagine worlds and move, and not be the motivating impulse, not the, not the new normal. You know, so yeah, yeah. The new normal is just the old normal. <laughs> <laughs> like it's just like homonormativity is like is a thing that's been like subsumed by like white supremacy and capitalism and you know all of these other forces. And so, like, I don't, I don't necessarily see like the fight as like a new fight. It's just like a continuing, evolving struggle with the same. Like the root is like the same power. It's like the colonial white supremacy. Um, I don't know if I care about utopia. I want to like live, you know. And I make art to live. Like if I don't make art, I'll die. <laughs> it feels that urgent. And so if what I make is in reaction to something, well, it is going to be in reaction to something, but it's also, I do think we do also dream new queer futures for ourselves. I mean, like, that's a project that I'm working on with me right now, is like dreaming this new queer future. Like, what does that look like for us? Um, and I don't think there's one, you know? I think that there are multiple, um, I think that there are multiple, but I, yeah, I don't know I, if anyone else feels the same way if we're like thinking about like this, like creative new future all the time when we're making work. Like for me, it comes from a place of immediate urgency of like needing to get my story and my history out of my body or into my body, you know? So yeah, that's where I'm coming from. Uh, I do I do agree with you guys very much so there's no above here um, <laughs> for art for um, my culture and with my utopia I do agree with Matt entirely there's um, there's um, <laughs> I don't know how, how would I word this properly now 
there's a way to, I guess, find a utopia. In my, in my mind, utopia is just, it, it's very, uh, I guess you could say childish or romanticized, whatever, I don't know, uh, is we can all just get along, really. You know? <laughs> <laughs>
because a lot of people here are from Toronto and Vancouver. Um, I feel like a lot of the a lot of the time we're we're able to say, oh, that's a small town issue. <coughs> um, that we're so progressive in the larger cities. Uh, Toronto District School Board is rolling in um, Indigenous history, Canadian history, into the curriculums now. And so the, um, the Ontario Arts Council have been doing um, uh, gatherings of teachers to explain some of these uh, the history that's going to be brought into the curriculum. And and there there are teachers from the Toronto District School Board standing up and yelling at these at these meetings and info sessions saying, I refuse to say that, I will not say that, that didn't exist, that didn't happen. And uh, yeah, it's not just a small town thing, it's, it's a Canadian thing, coast to coast to coast. And, um, it's going to change, you can't refute it. But, uh, but yeah, it, it's, yeah, and just to give that context for everyone, because I know it's easy in the big cities to think that we're so progressive. And Matt, I just want to say how amazing that is that you started this career theater. I'm born and raised there, uh, spent most of my life there. Uh, I just wanted to get, add more context for you to, to perhaps help you move forward with it. Um, I, I was in the first Pride Parades in the early 90s, and there's maybe 30, definitely less than 50 of us, fought for the five blocks we could walk down White Ave to Gazebo Park and then met at least a dozen God Hates Bags protesters, which is like a third of our numbers, um, to 10 years ago, where Pride Parade now takes over Churchill Square, there's a huge dance party, the parade is huge, um, all city councillors are behind it, Michael Fair was a city councillor, out city councillor for decades. Um, I, I, I would actually like to say that I think it's an incredibly queer inclusive city, and that it has come a long way, there's an incredible club, performance, drag culture, uh, there's always been amazing artists, guys in disguise, Trevor Schmidt was doing a Northern Light Theatre, I know you'll find allies with Vern Thiessen at Workshop West Theatre as well. Um, and uh, in, in context with the other prairie provinces, Edmonton is really far ahead and has a lot of support and a lot of allies. And, uh, and it's no surprise that a queer theatre has come up in Edmonton first. And I think that's, that's fantastic. And, and I, I think you'll find there's more positivity and allies than not, than more negativity and pushback to yeah. that. Yeah, I, I definitely I agree with the queer aspect of it. I, I think I was thinking of the, the people of color of quality. Yeah, I think that we, I drink yeah, it in Alberta. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, but for me, it's not just Alberta; it's everywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you know, it's like, uh, yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. There's a question. Um, uh, I've been listening to all of this. And <coughs> I first off, want to say that. Um, I, I haven't been practicing theater now for a, a, quite a little bit of time, and I'm super psyched. Like, I have hope for the future listening to <laughs> these younger artists talking. I was in that first um, panel around history, and so I felt like I was kind of brought in to represent, you know, back then. <laughs> 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 right here. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that was, I came home from college in 1989, my first time, and I take my first feminist studies class, and I came home, mm -hmm. and I said, Mom, Mom, I'm taking this really great class, and I dispute all of this stuff, and it was all about how we haven't done well enough, and that there's so much work, and how much all this sucks, and everything like that, and my mother, she looked at me, and she came up right into my face, and she said, you can stand on my shoulders, don't kick me on the way up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I may not have done good enough for you, but you're a fucking college kid. And you know what? I'm sorry we didn't do good enough for some of you guys. I'm really sorry. But we tried really fucking hard. We tried really hard. And so I know that there's a lot of things where you're like, it's not good enough. And I get that. And I'm super duper psyched that it's not good enough for you. Because it's not good enough. And keep making it. But somewhere along the way, recognize that we, did th we didn't erase things because we wanted to. We were just fighting for, hey, guess what? It's not legal, it's not illegal anymore. You can no longer be jailed for having a female or male lover. You know what? You can now march in the pride parade and not have stones thrown at you and you be the one being arrested and not them. You know what? There is still a long way to go. But we have come some. Just don't kick us on the way up. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think if I can uh, just uh, tag on. 
count in part of the circle, in part because I want to make sure I rank the slides, but also I didn't want to bring the energy I'm feeling right now into this circle. And it has to do with a little bit about uh, the decision to change the setup for this. And the communication around that was not the most perfect. Um, and I'm not sure, Chris, in my response was the most perfect. In retrospect, I think it might not have been the right response. But it was left to me to communicate to the original moderator uh, moments before he stepped into this room that the, that the setup has changed. And his response was to turn around and press the elevator button down. So um, I just want to add that context and I want to capture it on film that we're documenting this because that made me feel fucking terrible. Um, and I do think that's, a, that's wrong, that he is not here with us, because that's part of our history. Um, so I just want to add that. about making the space and those spaces safer for all of us, but particularly folks who are like the most marginalized by particular kinds of violence. Um, I think, I'm gonna speak for myself, um, sometimes I think the discomfort in these intergenerational conversations, particularly between younger artists of color and older white artists, is again a fear of losing power, and I don't want to put that on anyone in the room, I'm just speaking from my own experience of being in these conversations for a long time, since I was a teenager. Um, and, I really hope we can reconceptualize our desire for power, our desire for being seen, our desire for telling our stories into a place where we share the microphone with each other and respect where we're all coming from. Um, so as a queer person, as a woman, I owe a lot of gratitude and my physical safety for walking in the world to the folks who came before me of all identities for making that possible. And I recognize where they left me out and where they left my aunts out and my grandmother out and you know my friends out. Um, so when, and, and I also recognize like the embodied unsafety of my existence in this world as a person of color, um, and the embodied unsafety of so many of my friends who are people of color, my family who are people of color, particularly black and indigenous folks, I think it's important to say that black and indigenous folks in North America today are not safe. Um, in a way that most of us don't experience. Um, 
So, yeah, to not assume that the steps that were taken and they were significant were actually for everybody and to not assume that we necessarily share the same and like the same ancestors of the same trailblazers. <coughs> um, I was born here, I was raised here, I am Canadian, whatever that means. Um, and I'm a Western subject, um, so I do owe a lot to those folks. And in recognizing where they failed me and my people, it's not to shit on them. Um, but I also don't really have time for white tears. And I just want to like acknowledge that like that emotion to me uh, is frustrating. And I just want to name that. And that also, um, I don't want to talk too much about why moderation was I, I have no idea what happened. <laughs> like, I, I <coughs> not now, but if someone can tell me what happened. Sorry, can I say something? Yeah. Okay, so, um, sorry, I don't know your name, but I, I, I'll call you the screaming mini lady. <laughs> <laughs> Being written, 
we're going to be left out of it. Mm -hmm. They'll mention all of you, and they will not mention that the African boy was here too. Well, this is exoticized. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So I think that's what it's about. Like I was a bit taken off when we talked about history, and we're asking whether people of color their history was, and the answer was that it didn't exist. <laughs> and that is something that keeps being perpetuated over and over again, and it needs to stop. <coughs> but history doesn't exist. If you're really interested, go work it. And that's what it is about the fight, right? We do it together. We join the communities to fight whatever it is that we need to fight for. But when the stories are being told, we get left out. And now we are of a generation where we're going, no, we're not going to be left out of it. So it's not, not showing respect, it's going, hey, we're here too. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just something that I want to throw out. Let me remember. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so Um, and say that this isn't a new struggle. Like, this isn't the new generation is speaking out about intersectionality. It's actually like a struggle that we've inherited, a very politicized struggle that is documented, <coughs> well documented, that we are also a part of. And um, and and I, I do want to say thank you, Peter, for your comment. And um, I want to take up just a moment of space to acknowledge why uh, we've asked for a moderator-less discussion. And I think like so throughout this conference, there have been these four points that the QD BIPOC crew that we met just before the conference and we came up with some recommendations and they've kind of been brought up and brought forth to this conference a number of times. And this was an instance where we were asking for that to land and to be able to implement what some of these suggestions are actually saying, which is like, I have witnessed people that I care a lot about leave this room and not come back, and some who have had to go out and do a lot of fucking processing to be able to come back into this room because whiteness and structure has been centered in a particular way, which I mean no disrespect to the organizing, because I'm genuinely very grateful for all the work that goes into organizing this panel and these series of panels. And still, yes, there is work that needs to be done, and sometimes that work looks like shifting things and it looks messy, and um, had we had proper channels to communicate more effectively, undoubtedly we would have. But we did also address this a couple days ago after a series of panels that took place where whiteness had real problematic impacts on the discussion that was happening. And so we wanted to do something different for our panel. And we wanted an opportunity for uh, queer people of color voices to be centered and to not be moderated by whiteness. And I admire so much the work that Sky does, and I, I wanted an opportunity to be able to connect with him. And I'm sorry that he's not in this space. Mm -hmm. That was not the intention at all, was to ask him to leave. The intention was to ask him to step down from that position of moderation. And in future, hopefully we can do that differently, and I'll be glad <coughs> that he participated in that process so that that wasn't left to you as an organizer or to you, Chris. Like, there are ways we can do this work together. Um, but in this moment, this is sort of how it happened, and I didn't want to just say thank you for bringing that to this room and also share that's where we are coming from. Um, or at least, I don't want to speak for everyone either, but to say that that's where my part in this conversation is coming from. And I don't know if I have anything else. Um, I think I, I yeah. No, 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 you <laughs>
but it is that we are all experiencing this thing together and that hurt will resonate with all of us differently and it doesn't mean your hurt is invalid and the idea of is certain hurt more or less like we can have that conversation or not because we're hurting um so to just show up knowing that the hurt is uh is because <coughs> of the system and not because of um of individual desires necessarily but that the system is real and the system does educate us about what we think we can expect. Um, so how much room white people think that they are entitled to, the way a white person perhaps always says, I have an impulse to speak right now, and therefore I get to speak because I have that impulse. There is a cultural training that says you're allowed to take up space when you want to. So I just I want to just offer that. Um, that that the, the re-education process maybe looks at um, why, why do I think that every time I get to speak when I see five hands up in the room that I instead speak over them rather than waiting for those five hands to be addressed? Can I just add something? Um, I, I understand the, the idea of white tears um, as like, the, you know, I don't have patience for that or whatever, but I, I want to say from where I'm coming from, I, I like, I validate your and I validate those tears only in so much as that I know I know what happened is, is all systematic and, and whatnot, but we are individuals. Like well, I am a person experiencing this, regardless of the system. So if you feel what you're feeling and you want to cry and you feel upset and your friend like you know felt uninvited and, and, and this is important to you as an individual, I feel that and I validate that and I value that. Um, it's kind of like if I lost my car, somebody stole my car, I'm gonna cry about it. But then again, like it was a huge privilege to have that car initially. <laughs> but you know what I mean? <laughs> 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 I personally lost my car. <laughs> um, so it, oh, I validate the tears. I, I love that this is uncomfortable because growth is gonna happen in discomfort. Mm -hmm. And I it has to be uncomfortable. It mm -hmm. has to be these radical coalitions where we come together and we're uncomfortable and maybe we're angry a little bit and, and we're sad and we're, we're giving and taking. It, it, it's, it's a good place to be. I, the last thing I wanna say is that I don't think whiteness is a bad thing. I don't imagine, I, I think if the Islamic golden age did its thing and we were the rules of the world, I would not be on any moral high ground comparatively, you know what I mean? It's just the way of history and the way of, of the culture. And, and you were born a white person as much as I was born a gay, a brown person. Um, so you didn't pick that either. And so let's have these conversations and let's value each other and validate each other and then grow together. Because as much as I want you to just get it, that there is racism and white supremacy. If you're can emotionally, like if you're emotionally grappling with something and I'm stifling that and telling you, no, do it this way. I don't know, I see the world through an education lens because that's my background and education is uncomfortable and tough and studying for that math test for 18 hours so you get that 90% on the test, you know? <laughs> so that's all, that's all I know.
other thing that I uh, would like to bring in, and I would bring it to um, any theater maker group, but I feel like you know, queer theater folks, there's a particular angle of interest, is uh, the question of uh, making theater engage with the issue of climate change, right? Because we're talking about theater to come as a future, and we're all facing it. Who is already making work that is dealing with this? I would like to know, because I don't, I don't actually know. I would, like I have a question, maybe for Velma, Brian, other folks, about uh, Aboriginal and Indigenous community folks who may be making theatrically work related to experience with uh, climate change struggle, combating our sense of sex. I know that there's like <coughs> heterosexual folks in various places who are starting to engage this, but I feel like uh, <coughs> folks who have some relation to the queer community, uh, you know, as that Antoinette likes to say, we know something about diversity, and we know something about uh, magic, right? Like bringing magic to the world. Um, so I'm wondering about this, not just in terms of uh, content, like scripts that are, you know, dystopian or perhaps striking toward utopian futures, but um, like in the, the material means, I, I'm sorry that uh, uh, Evelyn isn't here because like uh, Bad Times Theater uh, has maybe more special capacity to look at um, like, a z like zero waste uh, goals, you know, striving in terms of uh, like props, you know what I'm saying? Like, how, how do we start practicing uh, engaging with this issue of like dwindling uh, oil fossil fuel resources and the, the impacts of climate change on all of our communities? Mm. I, I just interesting to think uh, I think she actually is working on a project about water and the not Canadian, but a woman named Diana Lucer, um, has written about um, the theater performance of uh, Pacific Islands, uh, in particular in indigenous uh, performance of Pacific Islands, and their work, and it's very invested in climate change because their countries, their homes, will be lost. Seasick. It's amazing. people we met before have been so fucking generous mm -hmm. and so fucking patient mm -hmm. and none of you have to be so like thank you and I'm sorry because this is like <laughs> a lot like <laughs> a lot is happening <laughs> um three the white fragility in this room is like really thick and, <laughs> and, and people have been stepped on on the way up and I think that's what like Leah was saying before was that like so what was a riot started by queer people of color and trans folk and like they're being kicked and stomped on with every fucking movement for and like 
I want to practice calling in and not calling out, but yeah, sorry. Um, I think we need to recognize how this space is whitening queer history. And I love what you said about documentation, um, like who's gonna be remembered in the space. The impetus to need to stand up and say that someone left this room and wanted to be documented is important, but no one did that when black folks left this room. Mm -hmm. And that's like really important. little bit 
some of us, and for those of us who choose not to engage in those conversations, I want to say that that's okay, because not all of us have to do that work, um, and we all step into the work of dismantling white supremacy in different ways, <coughs> all of those are really valid, and I think they're all needed in order to like actually dismantle the system. Um, and I also want to say that as a person of color, making creative work that's so deeply connected to like my own experiences of racism on my heart and my soul, it's <coughs> just to like bring it back to theater and creation. Um, I create from a place of more embodied and heart safety when I'm with other folks of color who are queer. And that's like a reality for me and I don't want to speak for anyone else. Um, and I know that there were like, I, there may have been some like feelings from folks about the QT Pop Only space at the beginning of the conference. Um, and I just want to like validate that those spaces are like very, very important and necessary for our emotional survival as well as the allied conversations. And so I just want to say that also to the room and um, hope that we can all like be compassionate with one another. When we are having these conversations and when there are feelings, because feelings are real, they happen. <laughs> <laughs> if I had a friend, somebody that I considered my friend, just be all happy go lucky with me all the time, you're not my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I don't consider you. We have to be able to fight, work through it, and grow. Yeah? yeah? So I'm, I'm just happy that um, this space is here. I'm, I'm happy that there was the QT Fox space. I'm not gonna lie, it helped me deal with being on that panel that other day also. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I do acknowledge that there are amazing people um, in this room and in my life that are allies. You know, I just wanna put that out there. I'm not always gonna talk about things. <laughs> you know, like, I, I do wanna say that I do have allies that I recognize that are very vital for my emotional health and in dealing with the world that I have to deal with. So, to shake me off. Um, uh, I would like to thank this um, whole sharing and conversation. Um, someone that feels pretty relatively young and queer, and to be honest, still struggling with the identification of person of color as well. Um, I really like what Mel said a panel uh, the other day about acknowledging privilege. So I just want to acknowledge my <coughs> cisgendered male privilege and want to acknowledge my privilege of um, kind of uh, from a Western perspective as well. Um, um, the whole point of that is that um, I want to ask the question of someone that is just starting out within that type of identification and learning about uh, uh, QT Pac and things like that and, and creating my own art to inform that. Um, what are some advice or things that you hope for for the next generation or of people that have finally solidified their identity towards, towards um, those type of identities um, of the type of work and hopes and um, things um, and resources for them that um, we would love to see or are existing. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge that there, there has been a lot of people in my life as well that have, that are white, hetero, like, oh see, even the language is hard for me. It's <laughs> so, it's so hard because I grew up in a community where, um, where I was the only one. And actually that community in my heart also made me who I am. Yeah. And, I, and a lot of them were white people, and a lot of them were racist, and a lot of them were ignorant, but their input still informs my perspective, and my identities, and my values. So um, I want to acknowledge and thank that as well. That yes, yes, that things could get better, but that we, it is part of ourselves as well. 
as as queer people color Q, Q tip hop, right? That is still part of us. That history. And we and it's it is a it is this pull this two edges that we constantly swing behind. And I also feel like our allies as well swing between. So um, just that question of of the now and the future generations for those people, um, where are your hopes of that? That was not clear, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Isn't always there, 
Or I'm not using always to put it on a pumpkin, but like that, that's, that's important to mark at this time. So, I just want to say that too. Um, I'd just like to touch on something you mentioned a little before. Um, uh, being an indigenous artist is a political act because we're here. We weren't genocided and disappeared. Um, when I did my first jury at Canada Council, I asked a mentor some advice. She said, it's going to be weird, man. There's going to be people twice your age, and you are going to be the only Aboriginal voice, and you will have to educate them because they won't know anything or have any context for the history and for the Indigenous applications. Um, as artists, we that we really our jobs there to educate, to to connect, to change the world. If you want to that. Um, um, and so, uh, I, I, your comment about you're tired of having that conversation. Uh, to me, that's life's work. You, you can't not be tired. Or else you'll stop doing that. Um, that that is our goal as artists is to always have that conversation. To all and. I can speak to my, only to myself, and as, a, as, as an indigenous artist and person, that any opportunity I can get to have that conversation with someone who doesn't know is my responsibility. And so to stop that would be to stop uh, fighting for what I believe and for what I believe our society can be. I really feel that, <coughs> and that's what I want my work to do. Please return your... <laughs> 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 donated to us by the Vancouver Fringe Festival. Oh, so. I, 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 
Yes. I just want to clarify. Sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Just, just to clarify something we discovered. This is the lander part. You can keep the other part. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, also, just um, to let everyone know, I didn't answer Frank's question very well at the Wrinkle Bar the other night. Uh, for those of you who were at, uh, at the, uh, the Pag and Dyke, uh, with Sky and Sarah and Evelyn, uh, about uh, what happens building on the energy in this room and over the last five days. Um, and I hope, I mean, I can't say definitively, but I can say a few things. Uh, first of all, the website will live and continue to live. So those of you who may not have had in your papers on time, <laughs> 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 Um, we will, Rob will be maintaining the site, uh, we will upload things, we will include the Kiki Pox recommendations on the site. Um, the video as well, again, thank you, an immense thanks to Katrina. Uh -huh. thank you. Uh, the video is also going to be uh, part of the archive of these uh, days. I'm not exactly sure if it will live on the website or on the Institute and I hope everybody will use this as a resource, as a teaching tool. Um, thank you to all of you for your generosity in allowing us to record uh, this material. Um, and um, as well, I just want to let you in on something as well. We've had an embedded recorder. <laughs> Sorry, she's one of us. Moynan has been taking diligent notes uh, throughout this because we've been approached by Canadian Theatre Review um, in their views and review session to have um, this be part of um, uh, that. Some, some report on it, uh, a mix of some of the artist statements perhaps that will be part of it, lots of Katrina's photos, I know, uh, that will be part of it, et cetera, perhaps as well the future pop statement. And we don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but that um, will happen sometime next year. So there are going to be these multiple platforms, if, if you will, um, that is the starting point for um, whatever we do next, uh, which I don't know what that uh, will look like. And the last thing I just want to say is thank you very much. Thank you from uh, all the SSU collaborators. My thanks and message to the organizing committee, um, and especially to Rob. Uh, you know, we could not have done this without Rob.
while we've been in this space talking and arguing and exchanging and learning and unlearning, people <laughs> are literally being arrested and dying on these streets mm -hmm. surrounding us. So this, this synchronicity is of a degree that I, I just cannot articulate right now. So for me, it'll take several weeks to process what has happened here. Um, and I'm pretty sure that perhaps even more interesting than the convos that have taken place in this room are the convos that will be taking place, will continue to be taking place outside of this room. Um, so I sense that there is a strong desire to um, make this a regular current event. Um, we will be in talks with various folks about how to make that happen. Thank you all for coming to Vancouver. Thank you for making, holding, and giving up space this week. Farewell for now. Until the next time. Salam. <laughs> <laughs>